It takes quite a while to get an underground line built these days. There are costs to consider, engineering, legalities and politics. Take, for instance, the Jubilee Line extension. That was first planned in the early 70s, but it didn't actually open until 1999. And in the meantime, some people got impatient. So impatient that they thought they'd be better off just building their own tube line. This is the story of the Waterloo and Greenwich Railway. I recently made a video talking about the Canary Wharf development and the fact that the people in charge wanted a tube line there. Not to repeat myself too much, but the essence of the problem was this. Canary Wharf was a development on a massive scale, and it had sort of come out of nowhere in the 1980s. Originally, the idea was that the then derelict London Docklands would be regenerated with small-scale developments. Billingsgate Fish Market was going to be about as large as the London Docklands Development Corporation anticipated things getting. So, the government didn't think the tube line that had originally been proposed was justified, instead favouring the much cheaper Docklands Light Railway. Olympia and York, the developers who had taken over the Canary Wharf project, were not so confident, and they pushed to revive the idea of a tube line. Initially, they pushed for an extension of the Bakerloo Line in 1988. That didn't work out, largely for political reasons. The Jubilee Line extension wasn't totally off the table, but remember what I said about how slow these things are to get built. Well, at the time, the Jubilee extension was third in line after Crossrail and the Chelsea to Hackney line. For perspective, Crossrail only opened last year and Chelsea Hackney isn't anywhere near getting built. You can see how Olympia and York might get frustrated enough to suggest drastic measures, and so they did. They proposed their own privately funded tube line known as the Waterloo and Greenwich Railway, also known as the Docklands Second Rail Line, but that doesn't have the same Victorian feel. They had always wanted a connection to Waterloo. Waterloo and Waterloo East between them are an important commuter destination, and Waterloo was connected at the time to the Bakerloo and Northern Lines of the London Underground, plus the Waterloo and City Line of Network South East. Then the line would continue along the south bank of the Thames. The next station would be Southwark, then London Bridge, another important commuter destination. The next stop would be Surrey Quays, located at the old Surrey Commercial Docks, which at the time were being redeveloped. Then Isle of Dogs. The station would be near to the site of the current Canary Wharf station. And I wouldn't be surprised if the station would actually have been called Canary Wharf had it been built. Next, Blackwall Point on the Greenwich Peninsula, near the current North Greenwich Station. Then Greenwich Parkway, which I assume would have been a completely new station rather than a renaming of the existing Greenwich Station. Finally, Westcombe Park, which would also house the depot. Two branches were proposed, one from Blackwall Point to Stratford and the other from Greenwich Parkway to Woolwich Arsenal and Thamesmead. Which means that I can add this to my long list of failed proposals to give Thamesmead a rail link. Olympia and York's transport department envisaged fairly short trains of about four to five carriages. These would be the size of surface trains rather than being built to the smaller gauge of deep level tube lines, like the Bakerloo or Jubilee. The tunnels too would be larger than standard underground tunnels, but this was so that walkways could be incorporated in line with modern safety standards. Now, even though the line would have been built with private money, it still had to go through the usual consultations and parliamentary approval, and this was where things came unstuck. The big question was, how much did this benefit London as a whole? And that was kind of a controversial question, because Olympia and York weren't thinking in those terms. They saw Canary Wharf as a rival to the City of London, and their concern was finding a speedy route from Waterloo to the Docklands that would be as fast and convenient as the tube lines into the city. They weren't looking to work with the underground, but against it. To put it bluntly, it wasn't a great look. The priority for London as a whole was relieving overcrowding, particularly on the east-west route. Olympia and York counter-argued that the reason they envisaged full-size trains was so that they could connect with mainline railways at either end. They suggested extending below the West End to Paddington. 
Furthermore, they stated that in this form the line could form part of an east-west corridor across London. And wasn't that exactly what was needed to relieve overcrowding? But this raised further questions. If the line was going to be built with that in mind, how on earth would four coach trains be able to cope? This line was on a whole new scale from the original proposal, and even the deep pockets of Olympia and York would have difficulty covering the cost of a line under the West End. Ironically, the extended version of the line, the one Olympia and York devised to make their railway more likely to get approved, actually worked against them. There was a conflict of interest here. London Transport were, as I said earlier, trying to get Crossrail built. Crossrail was a more direct route across the West End and the city. There was no way approval would be given for both the Waterloo and Greenwich and Crossrail. London Transport were also advisers to the government on the various rail schemes in the capital. So naturally, when the government asked them whether this Waterloo and Greenwich thing was a good idea, their response was that no, it was totally stupid and lame and only an idiot would approve it. I'm paraphrasing that. At the same time as Olympia and York were preparing their bill for Parliament, ironically with the assistance of London Transport, the Central London Rail Study was being carried out. This had returned to the idea of a Jubilee Line extension, which would do a lot of what the Waterloo and Greenwich was intended to do, but also would connect with the West End and the northwestern suburbs. So here was another potential conflict of interest. So it was that Parliament turned the Olympia and York proposal down in 1989. Not actually because the line conflicted with other proposals, but because they weren't totally happy with the idea of a privately run tube line. Instead, they favoured a sort of hybrid, the Jubilee line extension, but heavily funded by Olympia and York. O and Y had projected that the Waterloo and Greenwich would have cost £400 million, so that was their contribution to the Jubilee. While Olympia and York might not have been able to get their preferred line built, this was still the 80s, and money still talked, very loudly indeed. Therefore, the Jubilee line extension got moved up the priority list. It's interesting how similar the Jubilee line extension is to the Waterloo and Greenwich. For one thing, it was Olympia and York who demanded a connection to Waterloo rather than using the already existing Jubilee terminus at Charing Cross. From there, the stations are quite similar. Bermondsey is an addition, Canada Water got built instead of Surrey Keys, and the bits to Greenwich and Thamesmead were lopped off. But what if the original line had been built? I've read the argument that the Jubilee line extension wasn't fully built to modern standards because it was tacked on to a far older line. Therefore, it would have been a much better line if it had been a private, standalone venture by Olympia and York. But this is ignoring a massive elephant in the room. Olympia and York were considered to be the golden boys of property development, the archetypal too-big-to-fail company. Yet in 1992, that's just what they did. Britain was hit by a recession in the early 90s. Canary Wharf had been built with financial firms in mind, but none of them wanted to risk leaving the city. So the Great Towers stood empty. Olympia and York couldn't afford their contribution to the Jubilee extension, and in May 1992 they declared bankruptcy. After many delays, the Jubilee extension did indeed open. Public funds ended up covering much of the cost. But what would have happened if this was a private line? Would it have been abandoned half-complete? Or would the government have had to foot the bill for a line with limited capacity and poor connections? It's an interesting question. In my opinion, Olympia and York may have thought they were too big to fail, but the Waterloo and Greenwich was too small to succeed. Well, I hope you enjoyed this capitalistic tale from the tube. If so, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I'd like as ever to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your ever-generous support. You are the buyout to my failing company. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.